I think about the scripture sometimes like Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, he that has begun a good work in you, he will finish it. Now that's not without our cooperation. That's not without our yieldedness. You know, we have a part to play in it. But, but for example, just going back to that illustration I used. The only reason I bring this up is because when I say things like going to the memorial service for Greg's son. I mean, it, listen, it, this, it, this stuff resonates with me. I, I, I can't, it, it's almost like if I go to any funeral, we call it funeral service. Listen, my, my heart indicts a good matter. It's almost like the inside of me, I get stirred up when I go. But it all goes back to that seed that was planted in me. Because I can tell you right now, I've, I've been in many of his meetings. And I've read all of his books. And I've listened to him and over the years more than anybody else I've ever listened to. And I've never, ever heard him say that statement again like, like, like that. Never. You can YouTube him. You can pull all of his services up. And you'll never hear that statement. Death is not defeat for the believer, no matter how old or how young they are when they die. But God, through a man, because he loves us so much, he'll speak something to us that will carry us and help us. Even though we don't even know what's ahead, he does. The Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the glad tidings, the Word of God. Let me tell you something about this place right here. I know it not, might, might not be popular with some people, and that's fine. I, we're not in competition with anybody. But the main thing about this place from my heart the most important thing here in this place is the Word of God. There's nothing more important. Hallelujah. Mm. It's good, folks. Y'all ready for this? Let's pick this up. Let's pick. We're in chapter 5, and I cannot go back. I want to go back and say some things, but I just can't do it. So, thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, let's go to verse 17. Therefore, therefore is connected to some other things that were being said, but we'll pick up right here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Now, I've got to start right here. Notice he didn't say all things are becoming new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. He's talking about if anybody receives Jesus, is born again, what we call get saved. He becomes a new creature. And all things that pass away, the old things, and all things become new. Now let me, let me stop right here because we need to say this. When you get saved or when you accept Jesus, what becomes new? Your spirit, your spirit man. You don't get a new body when you get saved. You don't get a new soul. You are a three-part being. But the part of you that becomes new is the real you. I, I say it like this, the main part of you, your spirit. You are a spirit being. God is a spirit. You're created in the image and likeness of God. God is a spirit, Jesus said in John 4, 24. You are a spirit. You have a soul, which is your mind, which is made of your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions, and you live in a body. God gave us a body to communicate down here. But the main part of you is your spirit. The Bible says in the book of James, a body without the spirit is dead. Now, your body can have such trauma to it, or like I said, sickness and disease can come to it in such a manner that your spirit can no longer remain in that body. It has to go. It has to leave. Or you could just step out of your body, and uh, uh, you, I'm talking about you, and you could just step out of your body, and then your body would collapse. Because if your spirit's not in your body, you're not, <laughs> it's not happening. But see, the spirit man becomes a new creature. That, that, that's, the, that's the real you. Uh, that's what we need to major on. That's what we need to be conscious of. 
Okay? And, of course, we have to get our minds renewed. We have to be transformed in our mind. We have to continually be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Okay? Because we didn't get a new mind when we got born again. But our spirit man is recreated. It's a new creation. It's a, you are a new creature. And everything about your spirit has become new. It has the life and nature of God in it. Just like Jesus, as he is, so are you in this world. What part of you is as he is? Your spirit. That's why it's so important to understand spirit, soul, and body. Now, we may get into that sometime down the road, maybe in 2020, we may get into some of that. But for the purposes right here, and I need to keep moving, uh, the part of you that becomes new is your spirit, man. And listen, it has everything that's of him is in your spirit. You have become one spirit. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, He that has joined himself to the Lord has become one spirit. Just like when a man and woman is intimate, from the physical or the body side, they become one body. When you get born again, you and the Lord become one spirit. As He is, so are you. Everything that's in Him is in you. And it is sealed by the Holy Spirit. One translation says over in the book of Ephesians, and it, uh, and it forbids all tampering. You've been, one, the translation says, you've been sealed by the third person of the Godhead and no one can tamper. It forbids all tampering. But the other two thirds of you, that's something we have to deal with. That's why James said, receive, he's talking to Christians, brethren, receive, receive with meekness. There's got to be meekness. Receive with meekness. The engrafted word which is able to save your soul. He's writing to believers. But their spirits were already uh, become new creatures because they were in Christ. Got it? Okay. There is so much here we could teach from these scriptures. So much. But I, I, there's a context here that I want to get to. You ready? Oh, help me, Jesus. Here we go. And all things are, are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We have been reconciled unto the Father by Jesus Christ. Now, who, who's it by? Is it by you? Is it by your good works? No, you've been reconciled to God. Or we could say it like this. You've been justified. You've been made righteous by and through Jesus Christ, and we'll see in other scriptures, by his blood we were singing about this morning. That is what has put you in the position you're in, spiritually speaking, before the Father, or the way he looks at you, or looks upon you. And it's all by and through Jesus, and it's through his blood. It's through his life. It's by his life. But you and I, and really the world, has been reconciled to God. By and through his Son. Now, that has to be believed upon and received. John 1, verse 12 says, For as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them, the person that receives this, he gives the, the power to become sons and daughters of God. But the Father went ahead out of his great love and mercy, wherewith he loved us, even while we were yet sinners. He understands who we are. He knows us from the inside out. The Bible says he knows your thought afar off. Think about this. God knows what you're going to think before you think it. Can I, can I say something to you? Don't try to understand stuff with your mind. Get your mind renewed. to the, Let the Word renew your mind. I, I'm going to say this right now, and I'll probably say it again, because we're going to get into some things... Uh, even over the next uh, few weeks going in towards Christmas, that if, if you just try to come at it from a mental standpoint, you may or may not struggle with it. But a lot of times, I check on the inside. You know what I'm talking about? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I go to this new creature guy. And, and this new creature is who I want to do the talking and the, uh, the guiding. In other words, that's who I want to listen to. I want to listen to my spirit because that's where God lives. God lives in my spirit. God don't live in my kneecap. God don't live in my elbow. 
Now, he can quicken my elbow by, the, by his spirit that lives on the inside of me. There's power and anointing that can, can permeate and go out those areas and help you. But that's not where he lives. He lives in your spirit. So when I hear things, I've heard, and this is a lot of times over the years, I have heard things, and even at the time, I may have heard other teachings along that line or what I'm hearing about, and yet I may have a few questions about what is being taught at the moment, but a lot of time I lay a lot of that aside, and, and most of the time, if truth is really truth, I really know on the, on the inside of me when I'm listening to it that that's true. I know we can get it. I'll just give you an example. If you take things in context, um, here we go. I had a little, here's a rabbit trail. Um, Joe was here a few weeks ago. A lot of times people have a lot of different theology about end times and all that kind of stuff. I get it because they listen to different people. But here's one of the things that he teaches, and I agree with, because when I first heard it, it's not because I like Joe better than anybody else, it's because I listen to my spirit. And my spirit on the inside of me says, even though I don't understand, I say, I don't understand everything about end times like some people do, but I don't have to understand everything. Uh, you don't have to under, un, understand everything about everything, but you can listen to your spirit and your spirit will let you know on the inside. There's something in you go, you know what? That's right. For example, in the same context where Paul said, I, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them that are asleep, brethren. And he talks about, uh, we're going to, uh, those who are asleep in Christ, they're going to be raised first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air. But you know, right, right in the same setting and context of what he's teaching, he said, he said all of us, he started right to the church, folks. He said, we were delivered from the wrath to come. And he's not talking about the great white throne judgment. So if anybody thinks, I just, here's what I believe. Here's what witness is on the inside of me. You, choose which, you can choose what you believe. i just tell you what, what witness is on the inside of me because I just listen to my spirit. I'm, I'm not going to any, through any tribulation because that's wrath. And he's delivered us, the church, from the wrath to come. And yet you've got so many people that they'll fight you over it. But here, here's the deal. If God is, is a God who is love and has a love nature and he loves his family, why, why would, why, if he's provided all things for us, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, why wouldn't that be a part of it? Why would we have to work our way? Why would we have to earn it? Why would we have to be good enough to not go through it? When we don't have to be good enough to actually be delivered from hell itself. That don't hold water with me. It don't bear witness in my spirit. Don't shout me down because I'm doing such a wonderful job this morning. God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, we've been reconciled. We've been made righteous by him. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4, it's imputed to us when we believe on him. It's already a finished work. God's already done this. Just like he told Abraham, he said, I have made you a father. I have made you. I'm not going to make you. I have made you a father uh, of many nations. Paul went on to say, he said, I'm not writing uh, uh, this story or this. I'm not saying these things uh, just to talk about Abraham alone. I'm trying to get you to understand the parallel and what's been done for you and your sake. 
And what you'll have to believe and not consider the flesh and everything else around you. Just like Paul is saying right here. He said, there was a time people knew Jesus in the flesh. We don't know Jesus in the flesh anymore. We know him by the Spirit. That's the church. I mean, I know the, the 12 disciples, they were eyewitnesses and other people at that time. But see, the church now, today, we're not, we're not eyewitnesses. We don't know him in the flesh. We know him by the Spirit. Really, that's how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to know each other by the Spirit, not just by the flesh. You know, Dan and I, for example, we, as a husband and wife over the years, we've had conversations. You know, you learn a couple of things after 45, 46 years. I mean, you, you, you learn a couple of things. Just a couple. But we found out that we really don't want, go down, want, want, we don't want to go down a trail or we don't want to open up a can where we start critiquing each other. Because if you're going to critique somebody else, you, don't you know that's why Jesus would say things, uh, oh, by the way, i tell you what you need to do. You, you, need to, you need to go ahead. Instead of trying to get that splinter out of that person's eye, you need to go ahead and get that log out of your own eye. Because really, you don't want to start critiquing people or, or, or pointing out their faults to them. Because if you're going to go down the road, let's just, okay, let's just go ahead and let's talk about you for a minute. Do we really want to bash that back and forth? With that? Boy, that's really the love of God, isn't it? No. You know what that produces? Strive, envy. It'll bring on confusion and every evil work. It's not the wisdom that's above. It's really a wisdom that's down here. And that's what people do. Melissa, I don't know if I'm going to get through by the end of the year. In 2 Corinthians, I thought I was going to get through. I just don't know if I'm going to get through. I know when I tell her that sometimes in the past, she sort of grins at me. She knows, she knows me enough. She's like, he ain't going to get out of here by the end of the year with this book. <laughs> there are so many things. So many things. Y'all remember Scott Felice? This was Scott's favorite passage of Scripture. Every time we'd go to prison, he would read to the guy, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Every time. I, I, when I say every time, he, he may have missed a couple. But all the years we did prison ministry, I, that I did with him there, which is probably 14, right at 14 years. Um, anytime we'd do chapel service and he would get up and share, he would always... He, he may say different things, but he'd say... Less, if, he, if he read them in scripture, he'd say, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you try to tell them that God was not imputing what they had done in their lives. Because of the guilt and the shame and the condemnation that was over them. And they were reminded of it every single day. See, you're not reminded of that. See, we're going to get dismissed here in a few minutes and you're going to go eat something pretty decent. They're not. Yeah. Thank God for civil authority, and we have to have those things in place. The Bible says it's ministers, they're ministers of God to execute and do the things that are necessary, and we have to have that. But at the same time, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Matter of fact, I had one of the guys there tell me when he was sentenced. Now listen to this, man, guys, man, it makes me want to cry. But I had a guy in there look at me, and he told me, he said, when the judge sentenced me, because of what I had done, he looked me right in my face and he said, You, sir, will die in that prison. And he looks at me with joy in his heart and a glow in his face, the glory of God. And he says, He was absolutely right. I died in this place. And now I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. That old man that I was died. And I'm a new creature. And that stuff is gone out of my life. Man, I'm talking dude. I've told him. I've told this exact guy. I said, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When you get released from this place, you're coming to Jasper. 
And you're going to testify and tell people here. He said, I absolutely will. There's many things here. Matter of fact, Paul's going to take a theme here. For example, we'll get into this. He talks about, now then, we're ambassadors. Because of this ministry of reconciliation, because this love and goodness of God, because of the love that the Father has for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He reconciled us through His Son, through His blood. And now we're ambassadors, we're representative. He says now, verse chapter 6, we're, we're, we're laborers. And to the point he gets on down to the end of chapter 6 and says, listen, you don't need to, to fellowship and yoke yourself with darkness. Why? Because you now, you now are the ambassadors and the representatives now. You're to give no offense to anybody. You're not, you're, your conversation and manner of life now, because you're an ambassador and a representative, you're to represent the love of Almighty God and the love of Christ to other people. And even when you go through situations, you need to be rejoicing and magnifying God at all times instead of people looking at you and going, what's the matter? That's not, that's not being an ambassador. And he says, don't yoke yourself with things. Matter of fact, you need to cleanse yourselves from... Therefore, having all these promises, how God will walk in you, live in you, be your God, He will live His life for people to see. Therefore, you need to cleanse yourselves from, not of, because you can't cleanse yourself of filthiness or sin or anything of that nature. Jesus' blood cleansed you and washed you and sanctified you from the spirit side. But you can cleanse yourself from or not yoke yourself to things around you that would influence you. And cause you not to be a true ambassador of heaven itself. Paul, Paul said this same thing in the book of Ephesians. I'm talking about the pattern of what we're seeing here. I got to thinking like, uh, about this and the Holy Ghost brought it back to me. Because I'm fixing to stop here in a second because I, I got to go. And I could keep preaching for hours, you know me, but we'll pick it back up. But he said the same thing in the book of Ephesians. He said, oh, by the way, I, I, you need to remember that one time, you know, you were Gentiles, like everybody else, talking about the church at Ephesus. And he said, you, you had no covenant. You had no promise. You were without God. You had no hope. But now you've been made nigh by the blood of Christ, who has reconciled you to himself through the body of his flesh and presents you. And you've become one new man. Over in Ephesians chapter 2. The new man he's talking about is the new creature here. Then he tells you that because of this now, you have access. There's nothing in between you and God now. You have access. Then he said, listen, wherefore, you need to walk worthy of your calling now. Chapter 4, verse 1. It's connected to chapter 2 and chapter 3. Then he tells you in verse 5, Listen, don't even associate or have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but you need to be filled with the Spirit. Continually be in being, being, be being filled, be being filled, be being filled. Why? He said, because you're light. It's the same truth. It's the same message. Paul goes to the church and he tells them the wonderful revelation and truth of the gospel of Jesus and that in that gospel there's a revelation that comes forth to all of us that we are righteous are been made righteous become one spirit a new creature because we believed on him if any man be in Christ being in Christ means you gave your life to Jesus you accepted him that's why Paul said I'm not ashamed of it but he goes on to say this. Because we are who we are now. We're ambassadors. We're co-laborers together with him. I love it right here in, in chapter 6. He says, verse 3, giving no offense in anything. We, he's talking to the church. We don't give offense. We, we try to do anything that would cause any offense to anybody. 
And he says, verse 4, but in all things. How many things? Just, just a few things. Not at work, but, but at church. No, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. What? In patience, affliction, in necessities, in distress, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tolments, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness. You know, and this is how long suffering and kindness is part of, of, of representation of heaven. It, it's part of verse one workers together with him. Because that's what Paul did. Oh, by the way, by the Holy Ghost, by, the, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. Now he's tar- starting to talk about things, how they encountered things about them. Uh, people say they were deceivers, and yet they weren't deceivers, they were true. They were, they were giving the truth. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. You know, he went through a lot. Now look at this. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Here's a man who wrote a letter from prison, Philippians, and he he said, I I say to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you need to rejoice. And again, if you didn't get it the first time, again, I say unto you, rejoice. He encountered a lot of things. What he's talking about, these things, uh, the contrast... You'll encounter things in this life, you and I will encounter things that if you just go by the natural, if you just go by the physical senses and just a a soulish uh, mind that's not been renewed to truth and reality, then you won't rejoice in these situations. You you won't exemplify uh, uh, and be a true ambassador of heaven. But he's called us. Oh, he's called us. And he said this, as poor yet having, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. There was times in Paul's life where he didn't have anything. He didn't even have food to eat. And yet he rejoiced and he was content. Now he didn't stay in that state. There was times like over in Philippians 4 where people had brought to his necessity and give. And he had... uh, supply and food and clothing and finances and things where people gave. But there were situations and times in his life where he wasn't there. But that did not affect him. You know why? Because to be spiritually minded is life and peace. He said peace. He said that's why I've learned. You can learn this. He said, I've learned to be content no matter what state I'm in. That doesn't mean he wants to remain in that state. That's not, it doesn't mean he believes to stay in that position. But he's learned. Well, who did he learn it from? He already said he didn't learn it. Or no man taught him. Where did he get it? Jesus. I'm getting chicken skin. Mm. Mm. Jesus taught it to him. You and I are to be ambassadors because through Jesus, God has reconciled the world to himself. And we can exemplify and display the light and the love and the goodness of God. And you don't have to get under the gun or under the pressure of yourself. He really wants to live his life through you. He's never asked you to do this stuff in your own mind or ability anyway. But we do have to yield and we have to present ourselves to Him. And oh, by the way, not only is He interested in us being uh, ambassadors, He really loves to bless us and be good to us. You know, God is a rewarder. Hebrews chapter 11, 6. We've talk, uh, 6. We talked about that, didn't we? I think about this. You know, we talked about some of the things earlier, and the Lord brought another scripture, and I'll close on this one. You know the rich young ruler? He told him, he said, uh, why don't you give out of your, what you've been blessed with? Why don't you give that? Now, what's he talking about? Give what? Give kindness? Now, I'm talking about, we're talking about in context with the rich young ruler. What's the word rich? 
young ruler. The Bible says he has just a. The Bible said he had just a couple of possessions. Is that what the Bible says? No, it says he had much. In other words, he pretty he's pretty loaded, as we'd say. You know what the Lord told him? He said, "Why don't you give?" You ready for this phrase next? You ready for this phrase next? And lay up treasure in heaven. You remember we talked about how there's different ways we lay up treasure in heaven? But one way is through giving. I'm talking about finances, possessions, stuff. He told him. I'm talking about the master told him. The Lord brought that back to me because sometimes we say these things. You know, like we was talking about in other scriptures, like 1 Timothy 6 and Matthew chapter 6. But even the Lord told a man, he said, why don't you give that? He said, you'll lay up treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. You reckon Jesus was wanting to take away from him? No, I think Jesus was wanting to introduce him. He could very well have been the guy, instead of them casting lots, at the end, I mean, he could have took Judas Iscariot's place. We don't know. Could have, but he didn't, he didn't follow. He didn't listen to the master. That's just a little side note. The father wants to bless, wants to reward. Never wanting to take away. He said, the thief's the one who wants to steal. I have come that you might have life and have it more.